Thank you and welcome to this afternoon's payment session. I'm going to invite my panelists straight up because we've only got a short session and you want to hear from them rather than from me. So please make your way to the chairs. I'm going to make some introductory remarks to try and set the scene a little here for you in terms of embedded finance and what it really means to the financial services sector and in particular to the payment sector. So diving straight in, the I guess definition of embedded finance in the broadest term here is a financial product that is actually in a non-financial customer's journey. That's a lovely consultancy term for what this actually is. The reality for me is that this is all the financial instruments behind the scenes where customers are actually going to purchase something or indeed to have services. And I think many of us would actually have already come across these. Certainly any online platform I go to these days, I'm being asked whether or not I want to make three payments or indeed whether I want to make it on a card or in any other way. So these are already on our journey in terms of a customer. And the reality for me is that this is only the start of the journey. There is so much more to come. And this afternoon, we're going to explore some of that market expansion opportunities, what it really means, and whether or not this goes beyond a consumer to actually business to business and indeed you know, trade finance and all the other aspects of this. And it's not just payments. The embedded finance covers all aspects of financial services. But for the purposes of this afternoon, we are just going to concentrate on that payments bit. The embedded payments is the fastest growing part of the market, and so we really should be paying attention to it. And we're all familiar with them, even if we don't notice them. So uh, I'm actually looking forward to the time when I drive my car into the garage and my computer on my car knows I'm getting petrol, and suddenly it pays it for me. Or indeed, if I'm going to move to the future, maybe it's my charging scheme on the motorway knows I've pulled in, has already dealt with all of my financing. There's so much in terms of the opportunity of what the future looks like. But with greater convenience, there is reduced friction and therefore greater risk. And anything that involves greater risk, you know the regulators are going to be keeping a very, very close eye. So as payments continue to undergo a revolution, consumers and businesses are trying to keep up. And indeed, I'd say the regulators are also trying to keep up. So when we get to this, the risks as well as the rewards are coming from new payment technologies, and many of those sitting on the platform today are actually the forefront of that. So who is leading the charge? What are the risks? What truly is the end point here? And indeed, what is the future, if any, for cash, which is what I was asked earlier by a journalist? So to actually help me address those questions, I've got four experts. And I'm actually going to dive straight in. And I think, Jana, you're going to start off for me. And you're going to actually tell us all about the current market structure, how it actually allows that embedded payments to really flourish. Sure, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Kate. First of all, I'm very, very happy that you didn't ask me to define what embedded finance is. And I must say for the audience, it only took us a couple of hours to come with that one sentence. And I'm not even sure we, 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 we got it right. Um, you know, the, the interesting thing about embedded finance right now is that um, it used to be a buzzword about uh, two, three years ago. And, and, sorry about that. Um, we, we actually conducted a study about a year and a half ago about the future of embedded finance. We spoke to about 200 executives and asked whether they, they were thinking cool. about embedded Master finance. Kick. And we had a resounding yes answer. Okay. Uh, but we now have to recognize that market conditions have changed, and therefore um, the way that CEOs and CFOs and treasury free, managers and heads of product free cuts in the green room. approach embedded finance is, 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 is slightly different in the sense that... Okay. Thank you. See, we're creating technology issues. Technology issues already. Because of the IPs. I Sorry, we have someone else's microphone is on, yeah, so uh, and maybe the sound people can sort out whose microphone somewhere in the back. Oh, yeah, I know embedded payments are all hidden and behind the scenes, but we weren't expecting exactly. interference in terms of, of technology today. Yeah, exactly. So, so I guess the, the, the one thing to say is that because the market conditions have changed, because access to capital now is, is, is more difficult and it's more costly, um, business leaders are approaching embedded finance in a 
if I may say, in a more serious way, because they have to be more efficient with the way that they deploy capital, and equally they have to chase profitability, they have to chase growth, they are now starting to think, how can I get faster to building an embedded payments product, an embedded insurance product, and what is the best way, the quickest way, the most capital efficient way of getting there. So that really places a significant reliance on infrastructure providers, infrastructure providers that have already built that combination of regulatory framework and understanding and expertise and knowledge, as well as the technology and can offer those off the shelf solutions that businesses can imp implement in order to get to revenue faster. So I think it's, it's, it's really that shift towards, okay, from the academic conversation of how we could potentially implement, say, payments in some of the examples, Kay, that you gave, how can we now do that and how can we deliver this faster so our path to revenue is, is, is much quicker? This is at least the shift that we, we see. Thank you. And Miles, we've talked a lot, certainly in preparing for this call, about the role of the regulators. This is a regulated sector. You indeed, even in the UK, have got two regulators. Yep. So you're already managing this. So how are providers managing this journey? And in particular, you know, the DSCO letters, uh, what sort of impact is that having on the fintech providers? Yeah, I, I think for, for me, it's a, a really timely reminder, as you say, we are a regulated sector. It's absolutely critical, and we, we can't forget that. And what really frustrates me and disappoints me at times is when you hear people saying it's a sort of it's an afterthought or it's something we need to do to be able to bring the product to market. It's, it's not, it's an absolute core part of what we do and doing it well is absolutely critical. And so the, for me, the, the, the CEO letters are um, the baseline, that that's what we have to do as an industry and we need to um, work out how we achieve that and it has to be done to a high standard. I think the, the challenge, but also the opportunity is to understand how we do that differently, but still to the same level uh, that is required and going beyond, and particularly as a, a number of us, or, or, or particularly to your point around how embedded payments, embedded finance has to operate, it needs to be constructed in a different way, but still meeting the, 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 the standards. So the different distribution networks, um, agents, distributors, outsource partners, and then how that looks actually to the customer, um, create the challenge. Those are the challenges we should be solving, not the whether we are meeting the standards. So I think the industry needs to move from making sure that we've got those ba that base level in it is operating, to then solving the more interesting conundrum of how do you change the way you do that to make sure it fits with the user experience that we're trying to create in the embedded payments, the embedded payment, embedded finance sector. So complicated things ahead. Yeah, complicated, but I think that's the, that's the opportunity to solve it in a really productive way from a regulatory point of view, but also a user experience point of view. Excellent. Now, Ruhi, you actually deal with all sorts of sizes of companies, large and small, and there are lots of pressures at the moment on different parts of that system. So from your perspective, you know, what are you actually seeing in the marketplace at the moment? And in particular, maybe expand on some of the cost versus growth in the current environment. Yeah, absolutely. I think what we're seeing across businesses of all sizes, big and small, is that they're all facing this dual pressure of increased cost and a softening demand. So it's almost like a double whammy where customers don't want to buy a lot and everything costs a lot more. Um, and we're seeing that in order to address this economic tug of war, customers are turning towards embedded finance because they want to create new areas of revenue, new opportunities in their business, um, but that's not it, because what they also want to do is optimize on the existing revenue streams they have. So think about a checkout experience. They want to make sure conversion is as high as it can be in the relevant market, so the product is exactly tailored there. Um, we recently, much like Jana mentioned, we recently surveyed a bunch of uh, founders, industry experts across the world, and irrespective of what business model they had, what industry they were in, they were all thinking of embedding financial services in their business models. So Pranav, on that, do you actually see this new set of pressures changing business models in this sector? Yeah, I think everyone's basically wondering the same thing, which is how do we make some money? And that's both on the side of the people who are buying embedded finance and also on the side of the people who are supplying it. So you know, we do a lot of embedded finance around the world, and I think on the, on the buyer side, what we're seeing is increasingly people bundling services together. Uh, so software plus payments is a much more compelling proposition than either of the two things on their own. 
you think about payroll, for example, there are tons of payroll software providers out there who are basically just helping people to get employees paid around the world. As soon as you can add the payments aspect to that and also add FX, suddenly you're able to charge a lot of money because your buyer, even a very sophisticated one, isn't able to pass the different bits. So you can say the cost is going to be 3% of the payroll cost, and they have no idea which bits of it account for what. And so on the buyer side, we're really seeing this, this move towards bundling. And, and I think that really benefits those of us who are infrastructure providers, because we can marry you know, our infra with their software. I think on the supplier side, you know, it's a challenge, right? There are a lot of embedded finance businesses out there. The sales cycles are long. The time to revenue is, is long. And so they need to find ways to create sustainable revenue streams that justify all of the overhead that we have invested from a product perspective, a regulatory perspective, et cetera. And so I think you're increasingly seeing embedded finance providers moving out of just the core set of use cases. So people often think banking as a service when they think embedded finance, but also you're starting to see treasury. So how do you facilitate fund flows? Also, you're starting to see embedded payments and payment facilitation. And so from the supplier perspective, I think the, the kind of drive for margin means that you have to look outside of the core. And now that also brings additional costs to, to both Ruin and Mars's points. So given this is an ever-expanding market, and we've talked about some of the opportunities, Miles, turning to you and back to that role of the regulator, the UK FCA is taking a slightly different role to other jurisdictions at the moment, and is putting across the whole of financial services that it supervises the consumer duty. So maybe you can talk us through what that means for the payment sector and for your firm in particular and, and the sector you operate in. Yeah, sure. So I, think there's the obvious, I guess the obvious start points is to in ensuring that we're meeting that and we're complying with it. And, and that requires um, yeah, a lot of investment. And, and it's the obvious that the project resources actually going through the process, um, the resources to make changes to, to, to the business, but, but, but also making sure that it is not a tick box exercise, that it is about how the business operates. So, so for us, it's very much aligned to the customer journey. So how we implement a CRM system very much aligned to consumer duty and how we flow through from actually identifying sales leads from a marketing perspective all the way through to closing them, onboarding them from a compliance tech regulatory point of view through to then managing those customers and growing those customers, that entire sort of, if you like, funnel and journey and making sure consumer duty is, is really aligned to it. I think where the, the challenge and again the opportunity as I was partly talking about earlier is then how do we then take that into a, a sector that is new, it is still emerging, um, and in terms of embedded payments and then more broadly embedded finance, to understand how it applies in some different scenarios, because it's not a, in a lot of cases with the different providers that have been talked about that exist in the market, it's not a simple case of a bank or a financial institution having a direct relationship with a, with a customer or consumer. There's typically a distribution chain or a supply chain involved, and that actually complicates that process. And it can still be achieved, but that's, I think, the opportunity for innovation to do things differently, but still to meet really good customer outcomes through consumer duty. So this is definitely not a tick box exercise. This is Absolutely. much more about putting the consumer at the heart yeah. of any product and service you develop. Yeah, and, and I think it's focused quite rightly initially on consumers, but just having that, that ethos, that approach in the business to whether it's a consumer user or a small business or even a large enterprise, I think that serves you well to just think about that journey and the experience that the customer, whoever they are, is getting from, from you as a provider or your distributors or your partners or your software platforms that you've embedded in. And that's the, that, that's the bit that I think where your people are now starting to think about. There's the obvious bits of that direct customer relationship. But what about these supply chains that are in, involved in distribution chains? So, Rui, I think you can pick up on that for me in terms of that value chain and the other risks you might be seeing emerging other than the regulatory risk that's here. Absolutely. Um, and I think if you think about the embedded finance value chain, you've got so many different players in the space, uh, businesses or merchants who are offering their service. You've got banks, you've got fintechs, and you've got other providers. Um, and all of them have a different set of risks they're facing. But if we pick some of the most common ones, um, credit risk is a simpler one to debate, which is um, in, let's say, the case of embedded lending, you've got the provider of the credit, which is typically the bank, and they'll, in most cases, take on the credit risk as well. But if you move on to something like fraud risk, it gets a little more tricky, where it's 
it's actually distributed between the business, the fintech, and the bank, where a fintech like Stripe, for example, we take um, fraud detection and prevention very seriously, so we'd add interventions like user authentication or transaction monitoring. Um, if you look at banks in that value chain, they'll do things like KYC or anti-money laundering measures. Um, and then when you look at businesses, they'll have their own third-party tools on top of it. And where the liability sits in, amongst these uh, can often depend on the contract a company has signed with their payments provider or their financial institution um, or, or the fine print there. And so there are so many other risks like compliance, operational, and we could be here talking about them all day. Uh, but I think it's, it's, a, it's an unsolved problem in the industry where there aren't very clear rules for some of these risks. And maybe we could take inspiration from the likes of Visa and MasterCard networks that solved this iterating over many years and have come up with frameworks and rules on how does the liability shift and where the rules sit. And interestingly, the, the two examples you've given there, it's a very concentrated market. So this is a very diffuse market, very much a, a, a very competitive place. How do you get everybody to work together to similar standards? Yeah, uh, I think standards evolve over time with industries seeing there's value in one versus the other. If you take on more credit risk or fraud risks, sometimes you can get more value out of that chain as well. Um, but then different parts of the player try to iterate and solve it, and whoever comes out and solves it first and better kind of becomes the player to lead that framework then. So I think that's what we're going to see in the future as well. So interestingly, at KPMG, I get to look at the whole of financial services, the large and the very small, so from one spec end of the spectrum to the other. Yana, yeah, operational risk is something that you know, is either it's in the top three risks at the board topic. at the moment. So whether it's the largest global bank or indeed you know, sort of an emerging fintech, it's at the top of someone's agenda at the board level. Can you talk us through whether or not you think that firms have got the right attitude towards that operational risk framework at the moment? What are the safeguards there? What are the things we should be looking out for? Oh, that's a very good question, whether they have the right attitude, because often people ask whether they have the right frameworks, but very seldom do I get the question whether the, the top-down approach is, is there. I think, unfortunately, not to steer conflict on the panel, Miles, but uh, I'd, I'd probably have to disagree slightly there with you when you said this is the baseline. I think we have been making assumption that compliance with those outcomes that the FCA set recently is the baseline. But in practice, I think what we find is that very often the attitude of startups and scale-ups and, and, and the board's, uh, uh, I guess, uh, priority did not really feature this, or this was more of, a, of an afterthought. Um, I think that that has been driven by, by several factors in, in the past, but the reality today is that it's getting even more difficult for new founders, for startups, even for scale-ups to uh, meet that level of compliance that is, that is now expected, that is being put forward. Um, especially if you have to consider the, the Dear CEO letter in the context of global compliance, because an infrastructure provider or an embedded finance product or services is frankly irrelevant in a single market. So what you have to consider is that all of us building embedded financial services are doing this on a global scale. And what that means is that we have to comply with the outcomes that the FCA just set up for us or the expectations of the BaFin then what we see is emerging in Singapore, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, the amount of expertise and investment required to get to that standard is, is significant. And operating in a new world today, because I genuinely feel that we're operating in a new world in comparison to even 12 months ago, reconciling the need for that investment with the pressure on operating uh, in a capital efficient manner is incredibly difficult. So I think to answer your question, Kay, directly, the attitudes within boardrooms are frankly very mixed because every business leader recognizes that this has to be the baseline, and that is that stamp of trust that our customers require to see in order to move forward and incorporate our infrastructure in their journeys. On the other hand, we also recognize that 
compliance on that level uh, globally is incredibly expensive. And I think we'll see only a few winners emerging, emerging out of this as a result. Is this a hindrance to competition? At some point, probably the answer is, is yes, given the current market conditions. So we're not going to have a global set of standards anytime soon, I guess is what you're saying. You have to operate globally but locally in order to if comply. If we're talking about our wish lists, uh, uh, yes, I think this is, this is further ahead. This is further ahead. So Pranav, Jana mentioned there the word trust. And I guess that's a, a, a very hard one commodity in financial services. And we saw in the global financial crash how quickly trust can dissipate. So is this a risk for the sector? And if so, how do we try mitigating it? What do we do to build that trust, not just between companies, but also with the end customer? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And uh, money is right up there with the most sensitive things that you can talk about to someone. So with religion, you know, politics, money is right there. And sometimes I think we forget that as financial services businesses, that our first job and maybe our most important one is to build that trust with the people who are buying our services and, and ultimately using them. I think for me, it, it boils down to two things. The first one is value. What is the actual value of the thing that you are giving someone? It's not just because it's cool and we all get excited about building interesting products. It's because you're actually solving a problem for them, which helps them to do something in their lives or in their work that they couldn't otherwise do. And so I think the first part of trust is, tell me why you're doing this. Tell me what this is going to help me to achieve. The second part, I think, is about transparency. And it goes back to some of the stuff that Miles was talking about, the consumer duty, although, frankly, I don't think it should just be limited to consumers. I think it's to users and businesses as, as a whole. And that means, where is my money? As in, where actually is it? It means, what do I do if something goes wrong? Who do I talk to? What's the policy? What's the procedure? It's the whole package of things that come with being a responsible provider of financial services in a way that means that customers and users know who they need to go to, why, and, and how to solve problems. So for me, I think, you know, totally echo your point, trust is, is so important. The way I think we should build it is remind people of the value and then be transparent about the things that they're actually wondering, which is, where's my money? How do I get it back? How do I complain? Et cetera, et cetera. So the timer is telling me we've got less than three minutes here. So I'm going to round up with your wish list. You mentioned it before, Jana as to what a wish list might look like. So maybe if you, given the, the scarcity of time, stick to your, your single wish that you would have, maybe starting with Joanna and we'll work down the line. Sure, very happy to do that. Um, I'd probably say more organizations like Innovate Finance, because this is the, 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 the tool and the place that helps businesses like all of us um, channel our message and educate our customers. So the, the one thing I would say is we need to educate people more about the value add that a good infrastructure, good payments and financial services can provide to them and to their consumers so that they can grow. More knowledge, more education, and as a result of that, I guess, more of these sessions and uh, great thanks to Innovative Finance for organizing. Uh, I just say patience. There's a big opportunity out there. You know, there's there are a whole bunch of interesting problems to solve. It's going to take a little bit of time to, to get there. So let's be patient and, uh, and hold firm. Um, I'm going to go rogue a little and say I, I wish there's a change in perception in this industry that embedded finance isn't really in competition with banks as opposed to what we hear. Um, if you look at where traditional finance has gone from a customer seeking out finance, going to a bank, asking for an account or a loan, whereas now it's all in the context when the customer needs it on a checkout page. Um, and it's really opening up so many more distribution channels for banks where I think all the players that we've talked about today could collaborate so much more and offer a better service to the end consumer. And you know, for, for me, it's, it's really continuing the, the change that's been happening in the UK and, and also Europe, the, the regulatory change, the competition, the opening of the doors that's, that's started here. I, th I think we need to recognise that it's only started. There's lots of change that needs to continue to finish the job. And if a precursor to that is getting that baseline right across the industry, then the industry needs to do that so that we have that permission to question, challenge, to, to get further change into the market um, so that we can deliver even more innovative services. 
Well, all I can say is that my colleagues in my KPMG Singapore office have told me that the market estimate that they have for embedded finance at the moment in 2025 will be around $250 billion worth. So it's a huge market, lots to go after, lots of challenges as we've just heard. So risks, challenges, but big rewards. So I'm actually really delighted. We've started to scrape the surface on this. We could go on for a very long time, but it just leaves it to me, given we're out of time and this is flashing away at me, to thank Jana, Pranav, Ruhi, and Miles for their contributions. And thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you.